This was the moment the GCC crisis was born. Coordinated and multi-platform attack on Qatar state media outlets. Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, Egypt and the UAE say they're severing diplomatic relations with Qatar. We have uh, taken this step um, with great uh, pain. No one has given them the right to blockade my country. No one is giving them the right to separate families and displace people. Nations came together and spoke to me about confronting Qatar. They are trying to intimidate a small country which has the closest relation with the United States. This is the long-awaited list. The list of demands include cutting ties with the Muslim Brotherhood, the closure of the Al Jazeera media network. Our sovereignty is a red line. We don't accept anybody interfering our sovereignty. It's just past 9 p.m. here in Doha. The sun is down. People are out enjoying Ramadan celebrations, having broken their fast a little over two hours ago. But it was one year ago. The celebrations had been unexpectedly interrupted in a way no one could quite believe. Qatar was suddenly under blockade by land, sea and air, and its relationship with its Gulf neighbours had changed, perhaps permanently. Hello everyone, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. Welcome to this special broadcast here on Al Jazeera for the next hour as we mark exactly one year since the start of the Gulf crisis. Now it's not the kind of anniversary which is exactly welcomed or celebrated here, but Qatar's residents have been marking the day. It's generally a quieter time of year given it's the holy month of Ramadan, but even so this procession happened a few hours ago led by members of the local bikers community with flags and pictures of support on display. Now, just a reminder before we get going that this broadcast is going to be streamed live on Twitter, at AJ English, also at facebook.com slash Al Jazeera. So if you want to get involved and send us your comments and your questions, then please do so on those platforms. Right, so let's begin. How did we get to this point? It needs some explaining, it needs some context. And with that, here is Alexia Brun. I'm going to take you through a timeline of events now, but we have to go back to before the severing of diplomatic ties because there were already signs something was up. May 20th, the US President Donald Trump lands in Saudi Arabia to meet King Salman and other Arab leaders. Trump later took credit for Saudi's move against Qatar in a series of tweets linking it to the summit. Just three days later, May 23rd, and the Qatar news agency is hacked. It attributes false statements to the Emir of Qatar, their broadcast on Saudi and Emirati media, despite the Qatari government saying it's fake news. Then on June 4th, leaked emails from the UAE ambassador to the US reveal what appears to be a long-running effort to discredit Qatar. And that brings us to June 5th, when diplomatic ties are cut and an economic embargo is imposed. Now to understand the impact of the Gulf crisis, it helps if you can see how the region's laid out. The four blockading nations are Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and the United Arab Emirates. They accuse Qatar on this peninsula here of spreading instability and supporting terrorism, claims Doha strongly denies. On June 5th, Saudi Arabia closes Qatar's only land border, causing a run on the supermarkets and forcing alternative suppliers to be found. Access to the sea is restricted as well. To bypass the blockade, Qatar's had to ship directly through ports in Oman. Air routes were also closed, pushing Qatar Airways to make major detours. Qatari families with relatives in other countries and vice versa are torn apart. At this point, Qatar calls for dialogue, and that's taken up by the Emir of Kuwait. Weeks later, the four countries released a list of demands. They include wanting Qatar to scale back its diplomatic ties with Iran and close a Turkish military base here. They pressured Doha to cut all ties with what they call terrorist organisations, including the Muslim Brotherhood. And they called for the shutting down of the Al Jazeera news channel, as well as other media outlets funded by the Qatari government. 
Right, so that's how we got to this point. But a year on, the diplomatic stalemate continues. Qatar and its people are still under a blockade. But what has changed is that the country's made a giant leap towards self-sufficiency and, through some friendly overtures, cemented its relations with its allies. Hashem Ahlbar explains now. It has not been an easy year for Qatar, but for now, products from all over the world fill up store shelves. Cranes are the most visible sign of the huge push to build mega projects in time for football's World Cup in 2022. But a year ago, on the 5th of June, during the fasting month of Ramadan, Qataris woke up to an unprecedented crisis. Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and Egypt cut off diplomatic ties with Qatar and imposed a land, sea and air embargo. The blockading countries accused the Qatari government of sponsoring terrorism, accusations Doha has strongly denied. Attempts by the Emir of Kuwait and regional leaders to end the diplomatic feud have made no progress so far. Unfortunately, uh, we don't see any credible indicators uh, to suggest that there will be a solution in the near future. Uh, I think there have been uh, serious attempts in the past, uh, serious efforts invested uh, to broker uh, this uh, crisis and to reach an agreement. But unfortunately, the parties are still stuck in their positions and unable to move forward uh, with a solution. The four Arab countries were hoping to see the blockade isolate Qatar internationally. But what followed was a Qatari diplomatic offensive led by the Emir Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, who met world leaders. His country signed major arms deals with France, Italy, the UK, and an agreement with the US to combat terrorism financing. In April, the Emir met President Donald Trump in Washington, DC. The US leader hailed Qatar as a force of stability in the region. And Trump, who also met Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman around the same time, expressed concerns about the fallout from the crisis. It's a very unstable region, and the Gulf has always been the most stable part of an unstable region. And this crisis has kind of thrown this region into uh, a quagmire that, they, that it didn't have to be in. And I think the Trump administration realizes that, you know, at least we have to provide one pole of stability. And the center of gravity of the Arab world in general has been the Gulf in recent years. So why the, a region there, a, a crisis there is something that, that had to be avoided at all costs. Trump has invited the GCC leaders to meet in the U.S. in the hope of finding a political solution. But that invitation has been delayed. The blockading countries insist no talks will take place until Qatar meets their demands. Hashim al-Bara al-Jazeera. And that's not going to happen. We've heard that directly from Qatar's foreign minister, Mohammed bin Abdurrahman al Thani. He told Sami Zedan that Qatar will not back down from plans to buy a Russian anti-missile system, despite reports that Saudi Arabia was threatening military action if it did so. French media has been reporting that Saudi Arabia is threatening that military action. Uh, first of all, just let, me, uh, let us make it very clear that uh, uh, the purchase of any military equipment is a sovereign decision, which no country has uh, uh, anything to do with. So there is no legitimate grievance uh, behind uh, this letter and threatening Qatar. It's violating the international law. It's violating all the international norms. And uh, 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 the most importantly, it's violating the uh, uh, GCC charter, which is uh, the countries of the GCC should not launch an, any attack against each other. So we believe that uh, this letter has no any legal basis to justify uh, uh, any action. We have been subject to a unilateral measure which was taken by, by the Saudis, unfortunately, as, as a reckless uh, behavior. Does Qatar need to take any defensive military steps in light of this reported threat? Well, we are going uh, uh, to take the, all the necessary action to defend our country, but we L see Like what? What are you contemplating? Was, this is, uh, first of all, this is not, there is no any uh, serious military threat out of this, but it's uh, uh, the way it's been used to justify uh, uh, or to create any disturbance in the uh, region is just unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So uh, Qatar is uh, going to treat this 
uh, uh, the same way they have, we have treated uh, the illegal blockade, we are going to seek all the international fora to make sure that this uh, behavior is, is not repeated. Right, so let's get out and about here in Doha. We are starting at Katara, the cultural village here in Doha, with our reporter Stephanie Decker. Hi, Stephanie. How would you describe the mood of people, not just there, but the mood of people in the country these days, one year after the blockade began? Well, people are just starting to trickle in here. It is, of course, past iftar. Uh, we're seeing a couple of people arriving, not as full as, as it will be in a couple of hours. But the people we have spoken to, many of them actually not aware that this is the one year anniversary, but of course, everyone aware of this blockade. The mood in the country, you know, as we both know, is one of defiance. Uh, one of the girls said, you know, we will remain strong. Uh, what, you know, the impact of it, the consequence of it is that this country really rallied behind its leadership, behind the emir, behind the government. Qataris and expats alike. This is a country of a majority population who are expats. Uh, you know, you have sketches, a famous now sketch of the profile of the emir on buildings, uh, on cars, whether it's Qatari or of the expats. So there is a real feeling of unity. But but there's also a feeling of anger, of course, because these countries have made it so personal. It's not a political crisis in the sense that diplomatic ties have been cut, the withdrawal of ambassadors. No, what these countries have done have stopped Qatari citizens from traveling uh, to Saudi Arabia, for example, to the Emirates. This is a culture, the GCC, you know, there's intermarriage, there's family. So this is deeply personal. It's affecting families seeing each other. It's affecting students who are studying. So that is something that people here feel deeply upset about. But the, the general mood, is one that Qatar has come out on top of here, that it has taken the moral high ground and everyone's still remaining very, very strongly behind their leadership and certainly don't want this government to concede anything. Do you think people have gotten used to it all, Stephanie? Because you could call it a crisis, one year of a crisis, or you could call it an actual shift, a complete change in the way that Qatar relates with its neighbours over a good many number of years to come. Absolutely. And I think in a sense, this is, you know, we're seeing life continue as normal. Many people not aware that it is a one year anniversary. I think it's also many people will tell you thanks to the government and what they have done to try and, you know, bridge the gap of what was blockaded in the sense of particularly when it first started, Kamal, the air, land and sea blockade, people extremely nervous, not knowing how this was going to play out. People ran on the supermarkets and within a day or two, the government had found alternative sources from Iran, from Turkey, the supermarket shelves were stock prices have gone up somewhat but not hugely um, so I think people also very grateful uh, at how it's been managed uh, but of course yes I think a lot of people you speak to as well will tell you that they don't see this any ending anytime soon they're aware of how complicated the political relations are and as you were mentioning earlier in some of those reports you know it's almost like saving face they don't see how uh, in the short term at least this is going to end because the blockading countries haven't achieved the long list of demands that they wanted and again they agree that absolutely under no circumstances should Qatar concede to that so I think people have become used to it they're of course not happy about it but as they say they remain strong they remain very supportive of their government and their leader uh, and they will continue to just you know endure the blockade uh, as it goes on that is Stephanie Decker at the Qatara cultural village here in Doha thank you Stephanie well, after the blockade began, it was revealed the blockading countries didn't just want to isolate Qatar diplomatically. There were reports of a possible invasion of Qatar, even suggestions of regime change. Mohamed Val explains that. This portrait of the Emir of Qatar, Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani, has become one of the most potent symbols of nationalism here in Qatar. It was born from the crisis that shook this nation a year ago to the day. And that's for a reason. It took the blockading countries several weeks to make any demands of Qatar. And the list of demands that finally emerged didn't include what was later known to be the most shocking part of those countries' plan to overthrow Qatar's government. Their primary option was a military invasion. That's according to the Emir of Kuwait who made the revelation in September during a visit to the White House. He said his peacemaking efforts had helped avoid a war between Qatar and its Gulf neighbors. During the early stages of the crisis, Qatar accepted what may have been a timely Turkish offer of military assistance. With the war option put aside, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Bahrain and Egypt began to try other methods to destabilize Qatar's government. They tried every possible means in order to destabilize the government or at least change the foreign policy of this, of this country. But I think it had 
it has backfired uh, and they got exactly the exact opposite uh, results here. Uh, I think uh, the Qataris, they managed to circumvent all these attempts by signing an agreement uh, on combating uh, the finance of terrorism with the United States. Saudi and UAE-sponsored media outlets openly called for a coup in Doha and began to incite Qataris to rise against the Emir. They also began a series of attempts to promote an alternative leadership from within Qatar's ruling Al Thani family. Saudi media broadcast photos of what they said was a meeting between King Salman and Sheikh Ali bin Abdullah Al Thani, a senior member of the ruling family but with no role in government. It gave rise to speculation and rumors about his alleged aspirations for power. But months later, Sheikh Abdullah appeared in a video to announce that he was being held against his will inside a palace in the United Arab Emirates at the request of Mohammed bin Zayed, the crown prince of Abu Dhabi. In a similarly desperate move, Saudi-funded Al Hayat newspaper featured on its first page a non-existent Al Thani dissident whom it gave the name Saud bin Nasser. Using financial incentives and promises of influence, the Saudis also tried to buy the allegiance of certain tribes that straddled the border with Qatar. But Qataris say that process to undermine their leadership had the opposite effect. They expected us to support the blockade on our country, to give up soon and to stand against our own government. But none of that happened, of course. As you see, we stand behind our emir and we are more united than before. Their plot has backfired because it doesn't make sense for us to undermine our own country. We support our emir in every step that he takes. The emir's portrait, painted by a local artist, turned into a powerful symbol of national unity, plastering the facades of high-rise buildings, becoming almost omnipresent across the country. Other symbols against the blockade have also been created. Qatar considers the 5th of June a day in which there was a foreign plot against its sovereignty, its leadership and its economic development. That date is now set in stone here and commemorated through this feat of modern engineering. The message is not only has Qatar thwarted the plot that was meant to bring about its demise, but it's also become stronger because of it. Mohamed Val reporting there from what's now known as the 5 slash 6 interchange here in Doha, the 5th of June, isn't it? Right. Majid Al Ansari is with us here, Professor of Political Sociology uh, at Qatar University. I've lost track of the number of times you and I have sat in a studio and talked about this, but it's been a few over the past year, hasn't it? It certainly has. Uh, do, do you feel we've progressed any further? As far well, as a, a resolution, I mean? Ah, yes, it's good that you put that uh, mm. in there, because I was going to say, uh, has Qatar progressed, certainly has Qatar mm. uh, progressed in this uh, year rapidly on many fronts, but when it comes to the crisis, it is very clear that the three blockading countries, plus Egypt, find themselves in a situation where a continued crisis is better than a solution that could result in uh, losing, you know, uh, as we say in Arabic, the face is water, if you will. So which is losing the face is water, <laughs> which is basically meaning being embarrassed. Oh, okay. Yeah, and, it's, uh, and this term has been used a lot during the crisis to describe how this uh, crisis can come to a solution, mm. which is basically uh, the same as saying saving, saving face. But what are they getting so, out of it? What are those four countries getting out of this? At the moment, they were hoping to get a lot of it from the, uh, in the beginning of the crisis. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, we all know that that did not happen. Now, it is what they could lose if the crisis ends. They have uh, an emotional uh, attachment to the crisis now. They have a very uh, politically oriented uh, uh, media uh, outreach about uh, the crisis that they cannot take back. Any uh, solution to the crisis at the moment will seem like a defeat, mm -hmm. which is something that they do not, do not want to do. So, as with the other crises they are involved in, like Yemen, Libya, uh, and, uh, and other uh, places, the only reason the only way uh, forward is to, is to basically go forward and hope that there is a change uh, in the climate in the future that could allow them to claim a second victory. Let's rewind a year, seeing as we are reflecting on, on the incident itself, if you like, when this all happened a year ago. Do you think this all could have actually turned out very differently if Qatar hadn't stood up and showed some resilience and if the population hadn't stayed united the way it did, that this could have all turned out very, very differently? Certainly. I mean, if you look back at the 2013 crisis, 
uh, which uh, which actually resulted in an agreement between uh, all the countries. After that, Qatar has tried to uh, cater to the blockading uh, countries in, in many ways, uh, supporting their efforts in Yemen to some uh, extent, uh, lessening uh, the media criticism of, of their positions on various uh, issues. Mm. All of that, of course, did not even help mm. in mitigating the situation, did not help in making the blockading countries look favorably uh, to, to Qatar. Now it is very clear that the only solution with these countries is to basically assert independence, assert uh, sovereignty, and uh, move forward away from these uh, countries. There is no solution where we can see Qatar going back again no. to uh, concessions to these uh, countries. Well, the, the relationship has changed irrevocably, hasn't it? This thing, even if the quote-unquote crisis ended tomorrow, you can't go back on a lot of the things that have been said and done, can you? Exactly, and, and this is not an issue uh, only uh, concerning like media and uh, official statements. Mm -hmm. Even when it comes to trust, in the, uh, in, the, in the business uh, side of it, I mean, in the markets now, who would trust investing from Qatar in one of the blockading countries? Who would trust uh, importing products from these countries? It doesn't make any sense because at any moment a political decision could actually hamper all this uh, business void, like what happened in, uh, in Dubai during this crisis and, and with the products coming in from Saudi Arabia. Therefore, there's no taking back what happened. The way forward uh, says independence and sovereignty for Qatar, and it says uh, a balanced relationship with all our neighbors in the region, while at the same time making sure that we have sustainable diplomacy, which is a balance with all the powers in the world, a uh, good relationship with Russia, a good relationship with the United States, a mm -hmm. uh, uh, working relationship with Europe and, uh, and uh, Southeast Asia and Africa, and, and uh, normal relations with our other, other neighbors like Iran, uh, and so forth, because it is very difficult for us now to think of the future of Qatar without thinking of this balance that could maintain uh, Qatar in front of any future crisis. Majid al it's a pleasure always talking to you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you. So let's talk more about these efforts to end the crisis. Kuwait has been a key mediator. It's Emir Sheikh Sabah Al Ahmed Al Jabr Al Sabah. He's been urging Gulf unity, but so far, you'd have to say, his efforts haven't really paid off. Live to Kuwait City now, and our correspondent, Jamal al Shail. Well, Kamal, yes, uh, the, those efforts, as you say, some people will say, haven't achieved their ultimate aim, which is bringing about an end to this crisis, a crisis that has not only deeply affected uh, the uh, countries directly involved, uh, namely Qatar and the three uh, nations blockading it, but also have threatened the very fabric, the very future of the GCC, the Gulf Cooperation Council, which for decades many have seen as the main source of stability in an extremely unstable region. But what's been significant over the past few months is that although uh, the Kuwaitis have managed to achieve certain milestones, like preventing this crisis from transforming into a, a military one, transforming from a diplomatic one to a military one, there is a growing sense among certain sections of Kuwaiti society, actually, that they could be targeted by the same hawkish politicians and political figures in the United Arab Emirates and Saudi Arabia, those who have been going out after Qatar and spearing uh, Qatar, as they believe, in terms of uh, the PR campaigns, there are some here in Kuwait who have similar fears. Having said that, the government is adamant that it will continue to try and find a solution to this crisis. And uh, we spoke to some of the members of uh, society here, as well as politicians, to find out a bit more. At almost 90 years old, Sheikh Subah Al Ahmed Al Subah of Kuwait is the oldest leader in the GCC. He is nicknamed the wise man of the Gulf. It was no surprise then that when half of the Gulf Council members decided to impose a land, air and sea blockade on Qatar, throwing the region into chaos and threatening the GCC's very existence, that it was him and his government who stepped in to try and solve the crisis. From the beginning, Kuwait has asked Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain to sit down and discuss their concerns with Qatar. And whilst Doha has repeatedly expressed its willingness for unconditional dialogue, the three blockading nations have rejected Kuwait's call. That doesn't mean, however, that Kuwait's efforts have not come to fruition. A few months after the blockade on Qatar was announced, Sheikh Subah revealed during his visit to Washington that he had managed to prevent the crisis from escalating into a military one. Suddenly, this dispute came into existence. Thank God, now, what is important is that we have stopped any military action. 
Adamant not to allow the crisis to deepen even more, Kuwait went ahead with hosting the annual GCC summit in December. Optimists were hoping that it would provide a breakthrough, while the pessimists thought the summit itself would never convene. Ultimately, it did, and the fact that Kuwait managed to pull it off, albeit with Saudi, the UAE and Bahrain sending junior representation, was considered a success. Abdullah al-Shayji is a professor of political science at Kuwait University. And while the current crisis has provided him with great teaching material for his classes, he believes the GCC is facing its most dangerous phase in its history. We have instability, we have a threat from state actors, from non-state actors, you have terrorism, and you do not have really the, the luxury of dealing with all these threats on an individual basis or with a fragmented GCC. So we hope that cooler heads and uh, rational heads would prevail. Despite the attempts to mediate and an insistence from the country's leadership to maintain neutrality, many in Kuwait believe that the UAE and Saudi Arabia could turn on them too. The blockading nations have not demonstrated any willingness to solve this crisis. After Kuwait managed to foil their military plans, these countries were betting on time, hoping the siege would succeed, but that too has failed. Those currently in office, including this lawmaker who was head of the Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee when the crisis began last year, tells me that a solution can and will be found. There are efforts that continue behind the scenes. I'm confident and optimistic that we shall see a solution in the near future. My hope is that we all focus on the positives and not dwell on the negatives. This is the biggest crisis facing the Gulf Cooperation Council since 1990. Back then, Kuwait was being invaded and its independence under threat. Many believe it is the memory of those dark days that continues to push the leadership here to try and find a solution to this crisis. And whilst that solution remains elusive 12 months since the blockade on Qatar began, the fact of the matter is, were it not for Kuwaiti mediation efforts, this crisis could have been a lot worse. Jamal Al Shayal, Al Jazeera, Kuwait. Of course, the U.S. is another key player in this dispute, but for many, America's position has been confusing. Donald Trump initially supported the blockading nations, but has since offered to mediate himself. From Washington, D.C., Rosalind Jordan with more. A year ago, President Donald Trump took sides in the dispute between Qatar and its neighbors. The nation of Qatar, unfortunately, has historically been a funder of terrorism at a very high level. So we had a decision to make. Do we take the easy road or do we finally take a hard but necessary action? We have to stop the funding of terrorism. This was Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in Saudi Arabia a few weeks ago. Gulf unity is necessary. We need to achieve it. The Trump administration's policy shift on the Qatar blockade may look clear cut, but it's not. After Trump endorsed the blockade, the Secretary of State at the time, Rex Tillerson, and Defense Secretary Jim Mattis had to convince the president to soften his position. Why? Long-running diplomatic and military ties, including 10,000 U.S. troops at Al Udaid Air Base. The U.S. was also on the verge of making a $12 billion deal with Qatar for a new fleet of F-15 fighter jets. What's more, Washington had asked Doha to host Taliban and Hamas offices in order to facilitate long-term peace talks with their enemies. Finally, Tillerson and Mattis thought the blockade could harm the U.S.'s war against ISIL, as well as let Iran expand its influence in the region. Experts say they succeeded by convincing the president he had fallen into a trap set by the Saudis and Emiratis. It was recognized that with President Trump coming into office, surrounding himself by um, uh, non-experts and people who had been you know, not to have been in government or in the diplomatic service, that this would be an opportunity to score a long-term grievance. Washington's goal from then on, support Kuwait's efforts to broker an end to the crisis. Mr. President, we have a problem with our neighbors. And in both phone calls and meetings, a demand that all parties in the Qatar dispute solve their differences. The United States withdrew from uh, the um, uh, Iran agreement, and there's an understanding that in order to roll back Iran's regional 
uh, quest for hegemony. The, uh, the Arab states, our friends and partners in the region, need to cooperate. The Saudis and Emiratis haven't stopped trying to undermine Doha's status in Washington. But U.S. officials are pushing for the blockade to end before the U.S. GCC summit, now scheduled for September, because in their view, the rift is more trouble than it's worth. Rosalind Jordan, Al Jazeera, Washington. Let's look at Qatar's finances now, because when this crisis began a year ago, the monetary impact was immediate and harsh. Anecdotally, first of all, there were massive queues at foreign exchanges and there was a shortage of U.S. dollars at that point as well. But it's the numbers that tell the real story. About $23 billion left the country in the first two months as worried investors and expats moved their money to safety. It led the Qatari government to inject $38.5 billion into the economy, a lot of it going into the financial sector and into imports to make sure that food and supplies could get into the country, mostly by air. Speaking of air, though, the aviation sector and everything related to it took a hit too. The number of flights into Qatar decreased. The big carriers like Emirates and Saudi have stopped flying into Doha. It led to a drop in visitor arrivals. We're now talking November at this point. And it's figures like that which led to Qatar's non-hydrocarbon growth, that is the economy outside of oil and natural gas, falling to 4% in 2017. It was 5.6% the previous year. What's surprising, though, after hearing all that, is that Qatar's economy is now recovering and proving resilient. These numbers come from the IMF, which is expecting growth of 2.6% this year, 3% in 2019, which isn't bad for a country where the only land border has been closed for an entire year. Qatar's had to spend a lot to keep its head above water since June of 2017, but so far it seems to be working. Well, joining us here in the studio now, we have Khalid al Khatar, a specialist in monetary policy and political economy at Qatar Central Bank. A pleasure having you with us here. Nice you. Do you know, I've just seen from the Fitch Ratings Agency that they are revising Qatar's outlook to stable from negative. I mean, that's a good start. Does that show that Qatar has weathered this past year and is actually improving now? Well, uh, that's expected to begin with uh, the reason for uh, that was uh, political tension in the beginning to begin with at the beginning of the crisis, along with lower oil prices and uh, squeezed budgets. So the, the, these factors are no are improving. So this is expected uh, to be to, to begin with. And let me first start with a comment on what uh, on your report just mm. right now, you know, regarding capital flight. This is we're not talking here about capital flight in the normal sense. Mostly this was a deliberate deposit withdrawal by the blockading country mm -hmm. in order uh, in, in a context of a general more general economic warfare against mm -hmm. Qatar to destabilize the currency and trigger further capital flow with the potential consequences of high inflation mm -hmm. and uh, draining uh, foreign reserve and uh, de destabilize the economy with the uh, final objective of uh, economic collapse and regime collapse. So I'm, I'm, I'm not totally surprised to, though that the economy is, is, is resilient as mm. you mentioned in your report and uh, after a year it's in a good shape actually. Uh, uh, almost a year ago I was in, as your partner Al Jazeera Arabic, I was talking about this and I said this blockade is ineffective mm -hmm. and it's destined to fail. Uh, and we'll be surprised to see otherwise, you know, it, and there are reasons for this. It cost a lot of money, though, initially. Qatar had to dip into its reserves and spend quite a bit of money to stabilise everything. Do you think that had a, a uh, long-term effect? And, uh, and the fact that the borders are still closed, the blockade's still in place, so money still needs to well, be spent? Well, the, 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 the initial impact has a, an initial impact to, to stabilise the economy. It's, it's, it's not because we lost a lot from our neighbour to begin mm. with. If you look at the GCC economy, the structure of the GCC economy, carefully you examine it, you see the, the, the recipe for the failure of the blockade is there, right there. These economies are weak, structurally weak. These economies are not diversified. They all specialize, they are all specialized in extracting one natural resources, oil, and ex uh, exporting to the rest of the world and importing in exchange uh, most of their need of consumption good, capital good, labor from overseas. Therefore, there is not much to exchange between them and to trade between them and to uh, pressure on Qatar uh, through the trade sanction. These economies are not, these countries are not industrialized. They are, they are not productive industrial-wise or agriculture-wise. They don't export to Qatar machinery or mechanical, mechanical equipment or medical equipment mm. or electronic equipment, neither necessity foods such as flour, grain, rice, uh, corn, you name it. So, 
to boycott Qatar with what? So these are the, this is the fundamental. This is like uh, laying down the infra, the structure or the environment for the failure of the economy. Plus, mm -hmm. the sound economic policy adopted by Qatar, whether earlier, before, ahead of the decade, ahead of the blockade, the blockade. two decades ago, yeah. and while investing in a productive infrastructure and general infrastructure and investment infrastructure, yeah. which provides sources of sustainability and stability for the economy, or the counter blockading policy after the imposition of the blockade. Yes, there was limited uh, exposure to uh, the blockading country yeah. in certain products like poultry, uh, dairy yeah. products, vegetable. However, mm. uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a group of countries that were seeking economic integration uh, over three decades, that was natural. However, these, most of these products can be easily imported right. from overseas with high flexibility and can be produced locally mm. to, uh, significant, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to a to a significant extent. I and this is what happened. The government involved from the amazing. beginning and diversified sources Cut. and means of import and uh, opened the new trade line mm. and uh, through sea and air and utilized the yeah. high capacity infrastructure to bypass the blockading country and reach out to the original sources and alternative sources of uh, of import and then to ensure the sustainability of flow of good with, uh, within a reasonable price for the consumer. Khalid, thank you so much. Khalid al Khata uh, talking finances with us in this last thank year. You. Thank you so much. We're going to talk aviation now. That is part of the financial story. Qatar is a one airline nation. That airline is Qatar Airways. And it's massively important to the country, especially with, as we've pointed out, the land borders now closed. We go to Hamad International Airport in Doha now, and our correspondent, Natasha Ghanem. Kamal, Qatar Airways has not released its 2017 earnings or passenger data, but the CEO acknowledges its bottom line has taken a big hit. For starters, it lost access to 18 cities. Some passengers have grumbled about a rise in ticket prices and a more restrictive frequent flyer program. The CEO says this is part of a business plan to bring Qatar Airways in line with its competitors. One thing is certain, the state-owned airline is fighting to mitigate the impact of this blockade. Qatar Airways seems to be adhering to an Arab proverb that says, write the bad things in sand, the good things on a piece of marble. The state-owned airline says, despite the challenges of the year-old blockade, it received numerous industry accolades, including best airline of 2017. It did impact us that it uh, increased our flying time. It put pressure on my operational cost, but it did not stop the will and the determination of uh, us to keep on our path of growth. Qatar Airways says it's still auditing its books from last year and can't say exactly how much money the blockade has cost the airline. But it says the losses are, quote, substantial. Prior to the blockade, its profits were soaring. In 2016, it earned more than $500 million, a historic high, and flew 20% more passengers than the year before. Qatar Airways says it's defeating the blockade by implementing a strategy of expansion. In the last year, the airline has added a new fleet of planes, allowing it to fly greater distances to more destinations. When it lost access to routes in Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt and Bahrain, it added them elsewhere. And it forged international partnerships in the United States and Italy. But Qatar Airways has seen a drop in passengers. The cargo division has managed to fill the void. Not only has it not posted any losses, it has managed to maintain its perch as one of the top three cargo companies in the world. From a cargo perspective, it's a lot easier to redeploy that capacity. So what we have lost with the GCC countries, we've managed to redeploy it. The challenges are still not to be able to serve 18 destinations that we used to serve. The CEO of Qatar Airways says the airline can shoulder losses for the foreseeable future. And there's no need to ask the government for a bailout. But he admits it will be a very different scenario for the company if the blockade becomes a long-term reality for Qatar. Natasha Ganem, Al Jazeera, Doha.
One of the major challenges of the blockade came when the four countries stopped selling fresh produce to Qatar. So immediately, stocks needed to be replaced on supermarket shelves. But there was also a push to start doing it with local produce. How do you do that, though, when only 6% of your land is actually farmable? You get creative. Laura Burden Manley went to the Baladna farm in northern Qatar. These cows are the unlikely heroes of the year-long blockade led by Saudi Arabia. The Saudis went almost overnight from providing 80% of Qatar's fresh milk to zero. To cushion the blow, Baladna Farm flew and shipped in thousands of cows from Europe and America. And they bought state-of-the-art technology to run a large dairy farm in the desert. There's a total new infrastructure. There's a total new dairy industry which wasn't there a year ago. And actually, uh, in fresh milk, we are already self-sufficient one year after. We have about uh, 10,000 cows. Uh, and by the end of the year, we'll have, let's say, around 20,000 cows. So we're still in the growing phase, in the building phase. Everything the farm needs is made there, from the dry feed to the dairy products. And I'm told this factory will soon be run by robots. Now, one of the major challenges is to keep these cows cool in the blistering summer heat. And these water sprays and giant fans are used. The cows then step onto the state-of-the-art rotary parlour from Ireland, where up to 750 of them are milked in a single hour. After feed, they then go to sleep on rubber mattresses to keep them raised off the warm ground. The company's vice president says there was too much competition from other Gulf countries before the blockade to get a share in the market. It's open big opportunities for these entrepreneurs in order to develop themselves, develop their own companies by creating uh, small and medium-sized companies in order to fulfill the gap. And now he's looking to expand beyond Qatar. We are planning to expand more in, uh, by the end of the year by bringing two more uh, shipments in order to start exporting uh, to outside uh, Qatar. And we will be targeting first like uh, 20 countries. Of the $1 billion worth of all food imports to Qatar three years ago, the Saudis and the United Arab Emirates sold about a third. So who else is filling the gaps in the market now? We were also able to find alternative products, especially for a lot of the detergents and a lot of the food uh, supply, also through Turkey, uh, Oman, Lebanon, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria, uh, Europe, all across Europe. For every product, there is a hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of, pro from, uh, of products. If you, if you close one door, there is a thousand doors that are open. For many countries, the blockade was a wake-up call towards self-sufficiency. And it's allowed new international investors to take a slice of the pie, too. Laura Badamanli, Al Jazeera, Doha. We keep talking about the impact of this blockade on the economy, on supply lines, on political relationships, but the human cost of the blockade, pretty much immeasurable. You know, Qatar's National Human Rights Council says the blockade affected more than 13,000 people. Over 4,000 cases of human rights violations were reported in the past year. And it affected all aspects of daily life, education, health care, the right to perform religious rituals, hold property, freedom of movement, and perhaps most crucially, the right to family reunification. Remember, this is a region where family ties go beyond borders. And yet the blockading nations forcibly deported Qataris and separated children from their parents. They also cracked down on their own nationals for expressing any sympathy for Qatar by fixing jail terms and penalties. So there's a really important people story to tell here. Victoria Gatenby is going to do that. The political crisis in the Gulf is threatening to tear this family apart. Wafa al Yazidi is Qatari, but her children are Bahraini citizens. In Gulf countries, children take the citizenship of their father. Rashid's Bahraini passport runs out next year. He believes if he continues to defy an order by Bahrain to leave Qatar, he'll lose his Bahraini passport and be stateless. Once my passport expires, what do I do? Do I stay here and not pursue my future because I don't have a passport? Because I did not want to go to the country that I hold the citizenship, nothing else but the citizenship, then that's some sort of leverage that they have against me. It's not just families living in limbo. Students too have had their lives turned upside down. 
Last year, at least 700 Emirati, Bahraini and Saudi students were forced to abandon their courses at universities like this one in Qatar after they were ordered to return home by their governments. Hundreds of Qatari students were sent back to Doha, unable to complete their courses or take their final year exams. We spoke to students at Georgetown University in Qatar in the days following the blockade being imposed and again one year on to find out what life has been like since. You see that suddenly these students don't have records. You see that they're being exiled from their education, which is a right. You see that they have to start all over again sometimes in certain cases and then they're not granted access the way they're supposed to. So it's been a very ugly war against education and humanity as a whole. I know someone whose education was personally disrupted. She was a medical student approaching graduation in the UAE and she had to come back to Qatar and when the National Human Rights Committee contacted her university asking for her files, they said that they have no records of her files of her ever being a student. Qatar's Human Rights Committee has urged the UN to intervene. After one year, they continues to use the people and use the civilians as the make a pressure for Qatar government but in the same things they are fail and they are they cannot achieve anything to use the people in this crisis the Gulf crisis is a diplomatic dispute between governments but its consequences are being felt by people in a way they wouldn't have imagined a year ago Victoria Gatenby Al Jazeera Doha in any crisis like this, the media is crucial. There's been a lot of coverage in this part of the world, much of it full of rhetoric and propaganda on the airwaves and online. And there was the less than subtle demand that the Al Jazeera media network be shut down, something we've obviously rejected outright. Here is Richard Gisbet from The Listening Post with more. When Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain and Egypt all severed ties with Qatar on the 5th of June last year, the region's news media were quickly deployed to play their part in the diplomatic showdown. The rift was triggered by a piece of news that mysteriously appeared on the website of the Qatar news agency, although the QNA denies putting it there. The country's emir was quoted in that piece, making incendiary remarks about regional leaders and purportedly criticizing Donald Trump, as well as praising Iran. News reports have since emerged, alleging that operatives in the UAE were behind that hack. However, in the days that followed, media outlets in the Gulf, especially from Saudi Arabia and the UAE, seized on the fake story and rolled out what seemed to be a coordinated campaign to put pressure on Qatar. The political crisis in the region played out in an unusually public way. And over the past year, a spat that would have traditionally been managed behind closed doors was aired across the news media, coverage designed to portray Qatar as a regional sponsor of terrorism. أدلة جديدة على تورط قطر بدعم الإرهاب لا تنفك وسائل الإعلام العالمية على نشر المزيد منها أهلا بحضراتكم مشاهدينا الكرام في هذا العرض الذي نسلط خلاله الضوء على الكويت التي لم تكن بمنأ عن الشرور القطرية دوها has refused to see to any of its adversaries demands among them the closure of this network Al Jazeera or as Egyptian news anchors call the network Al Kanzira the pig and the media battle has not just been waged within the region it has spread across to the United States, where both sides hit the airwaves with official voices to fight in their corners, and in the case of Qatar's emir, to defend his country's news network. When you tell me to close a channel like Al Jazeera, history will write one day in 50 or 60, 70 years how it changed the whole idea of free speech in the region. However, most of what's been going on in Washington has happened away from the cameras. Saudi Arabia, the UAE and Qatar have all spent millions of dollars on public relations and political lobbying as they seek to strengthen ties with the Trump administration and to bring the U.S. media on side. It is within the region itself where most of the public side of this is being fought, on the airwaves. One year on, though, the standoff continues, and there is still no sign of Al Jazeera going to black. And it goes further because media coverage is one thing, media campaigns are quite another and there have been these concerted, particularly by outlets in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, and particularly using social media. Here's Andrew Chappelle with more. The opening shots were fired by an army of bots on Twitter. Now, bots are software that can be programmed to interact with other Twitter accounts on their own to spread whatever message you program them to. You just tell them what to do. 
You can even build or buy an army of bots, hundreds or thousands of them, to flood Twitter with your ideas, boosting a conversation or hashtag until it takes off on its own, to even make them trend in your city or country. In April 2017, weeks before the summit in Riyadh, where U.S. President Trump called on Arab and Muslim leaders to drive out the terrorists and drive out the extremists. Thousands of Arabic language bots appeared on Twitter, flooding it with sectarian messages and anti-Qatar propaganda. They began shaping the online debate on terrorism. A lot of the rhetoric that these bots were promoting on Twitter uh, was similar to the demands that were later made. So, for example, one of the bot trends was, was about uh, Qatar's bankrolling of terrorism. And these occurred, uh, obviously, before the outbreak of news. When the um, news of the hack surfaced, one of the bot networks revealed that there were bot accounts set up in April 2017. So these bot accounts, a large network, were set up a month before the news of the, of, of the hack, and they became active at the announcement of the news of the hack. You can see that a lot of the narratives being spread by these bots mirrors the narratives of the quartet countries. It'll be interesting to see how matters play out in this region as Twitter works to weed out bot armies. In the meantime, political agendas are being pushed by all these active users who are actually bots. You know, in four years from now, Qatar will host the FIFA World Cup, a massive project and what will be a landmark moment in the country's history. But there's a lot to do, and Joanna Gajarovska has been looking at how the blockades affected preparations for the big tournament. The World Cup was awarded to Qatar eight years ago and preparations began almost immediately after FIFA's announcement. For the last year, they've continued despite the political dispute and the air, sea and land blockade. Now, there was some disruption to the supply of construction material initially, but organisers say that all eight stadiums are on schedule, with several expected to be ready by 2020, two years ahead of the tournament. As the Middle East's first World Cup, Qatar's hosting committee is hoping that it can still bring the region closer together. We recognize that power for what it means for our people. And when I say our people, it's not Qatar. When I say our people, it's the Arab world and the Middle East. And it will always be worth it. And it will always continue being worth it. We suffered abuse, yes, we suffered abuse. Did we ever regret it? No, we'll never regret it. Well, still, the national and club teams have felt the pressure of politics on the pitch. December's Gulf Cup had to be moved from Qatar to Kuwait at the last minute. But on a club level, Asian Champions League matches went ahead in Qatar. And away from football, Qatar has continued to host big-name sports stars at its annual top-level tennis competitions. It held golf's Qatar Masters and Athletics Diamond League meet in May. And next year, it will host its highest-profile athletics event so far, the World Championships. I think it's very important that Qatar is getting itself out there with regards to sports, sports competitions um, and basically saying, you know, we, we, we're still operating as a country, we're an independent country and also trying to garner some empathy, I'm sure, for, from international sporting crowds. A member of the royal family tweeted not too long ago that Qatar will bid and get the Olympics at some stage. There's only a few countries that can actually host them, so Qatar has a chance that way that would bring up the dreaded conversation about Qatari weather again. But yes, I, I think there's no doubt that they will bid. They will bid uh, for the Olympics uh, post the next Games. Whatever the future holds for Qatar in this crisis, its sporting ambition has only grown stronger over the last year. You'll have seen this plenty, the artistic image of Qatar's Emir, which became a real focal point of this past year. But don't think this is about just one image. The blockade's been a driving force for artists and artistic expression in Qatar. Sara Khairat walks us through the changing art scene now and how people have found inspiration through crisis. This converted fire station here in Doha was transformed several years ago into an art gallery and workshop space. It's become a hub for the artistic community here in Qatar. And in the last 12 months, it's taken on a life of its own. The walls have been turned into massive canvases showcasing young local talent and their take on the Gulf crisis. Five artists in 10 days, that's all it took to create these large-scale graffiti images, all inspired by the blockade in Qatar. Bulgarian artist Dmitry Bogoraski created this piece, covered in words of positivity like forward and love. 
a way, he says, to convey the unity that Qataris have been feeling since the blockade started last June. The continuing blockade has energized artists in different ways. Ghada El Khatu's series Blockade Energy Drink has been to Paris and back. And the artist who describes herself as a political artunist says she's found humour in the irrationality of the situation. And just down the road and along the Arabian Sea lies Qatar's cultural village Qatara. Its modern twist on Arabic-inspired architecture is reflected in the type of art displayed here, whether it's by Qataris or expat artists. This project, called Beyond Appearances, was born out of the situation people living in Qatar found themselves in. It's about perception, an exchange of ideas and views, life changes even, and the journey itself. This huge neon sign by Martin Creed is hard to miss here at the Museum of Islamic Art. It's minimalistic with a big impact, and it was newly created especially for the blockade's one-year anniversary. But its message is simple, that everything is going to be all right. Sara Khairat, Al Jazeera, Doha. And that is it for our Gulf Crisis One Year Special, a crisis that, as you will have seen, doesn't really look like it's ending anytime soon. So you can be sure that we here at Al Jazeera will continue reporting on it, just as we always have, even though we've unwillingly become part of the story itself. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team here in Doha. Thanks for joining us. We're going to leave you now with the personal thoughts of some of the people of Qatar on this 5th of June 2018, after a year under blockade. Thanks for joining us. What made this different was they targeted people. We just came together as residents and Qatari nationals. It was a really nice and uniting time in a bittersweet sort of way. <laughs>